Hello and welcome everyone. My name is John Parsons. I'm the Managing Director of the NCAA Sports Science Institute. And I want to welcome you to this discussion about COVID-19 and its implications for athletic health care providers and a discussion about things they need to know as they begin to prepare for the administration of health care services to student athletes in the wake of this pandemic. This is a conversation with, about, and for athletic health care providers and medical decision makers. We're specifically speaking today about and to athletics healthcare administrators, athletic trainers, team physicians, mental health professionals, and really anybody that has responsibility for attending to the health and well being of student athletes. I'm joined by several such individuals today for this discussion. I'd like to take a few seconds to introduce you to them. First, Dr. Brian Hainline, a physician, senior vice president at the NCAA, and its first chief medical officer. Next, Dr. Jess Moeller. She's a clinical and sports psychologist at the United States Naval Academy, also the assistant director of the Midshipman Development Center, and importantly, the current chair of the NCAA Committee on Competitive Safeguards and Medical Aspects of Sport. Next, Dr. Stephanie Chu, sports medicine physician at the University of Colorado, where she also serves as a team physician. She's an associate professor in the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and she's providing service both to the NCAA COVID-19 advisory panel, as well as to the NCAA Committee on Competitive Safeguards and Medical Aspects of Sport. And last, but certainly not least, Kim Terrell. Kim, an athletic trainer, is a senior associate director of athletic medicine at the University of Oregon. She's also Oregon's athletic health care administrator, and she too is a member of the NCAA Committee on Competitive Safeguards in Medical Aspects of Sport. What we plan to do with our time is simply have a discussion. We've accumulated a number of questions that we've heard from the membership that are on our own minds, that we've seen our committees and, and other leadership groups wrestle with, and so we just would like to spend some time talking through those issues in hopes that uh, those answers will provide you with some guidance uh, to issues that you too are wrestling with as you work through planning uh, and preparation uh, for return of student athletes in the wake of this pandemic. I want to start by spending a little bit of time on the decision making processes and the decision making structures that have been established uh, in the association. And to date, there's been three primary sources of information, uh, centers of decision-making, if you will, and I'd like to explore them. The first is the COVID-19 advisory panel. The second is the COVID-19 action team, or CAT. And the third is the COVID-19 playing and practices and working group. And Brian, I wanna turn first to you because you have been very involved uh, in the advisory panel as well as the action team. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your experiences and what the role of those two bodies has been and will continue to be as we work through some of these issues. Well, thanks, John, and, and hello, everyone. And, and also, um, thanks to uh, my colleagues, Kim and, and Jess and, and Stephanie. It's, it's always great to be with you. So the, the, the COVID-19 advisory panel is a, a group of seven individuals who, who are really uh, leaders of uh, national and, and, and world-renowned leaders in, in global health, public health, infectious disease, uh, security at, at mass professional sporting events. And then uh, Stephanie Chu is also a member uh, representing competitive safeguards and our team physicians. So we've been meeting uh, formally uh, twice weekly, and then we have several communications in between. And we had started meeting at the beginning of March, and it was actually the advisory panel that first recommended to the NCAA senior leadership and ultimately the Board of Governors uh, that we not have fans at the Final Four. And, and then ultimately we moved from there to canceling all of the winter and spring championships. So working with them, it, it just, helped uh, me as, as someone who's then um, speaking to the membership and providing uh, guidance to, to the membership, helping them make informed decisions. They're really very up to date. Uh, one works very closely with the CDC, another with Health and Human Services. And, and so it just 
it, it's a sense of at least staying kind of a half a step ahead. I mean, everything is evolving so rapidly and no one is an expert in, in, in this area because no one's ever seen a virus uh, like this in, 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 in modern day. I mean, you know, we've seen H1N1, but that was not nearly the same. And, and SARS, which is a close relative, but, um, but was not nearly as contagious. So we have to really go back to 1918. So they've also been involved in shaping our first uh, uh, core principles of socialization statement. Um, they reviewed the frequently asked questions document we sent out. And we're now working on a, another document that, that we hope to be sending to the membership um, in about one week. Uh, so that we're, we're aiming for May 28th. And that really is a, 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 a sequel to the core principles document. And it goes into a lot of action item considerations. So what was really interesting as a, a subgroup of the advisory panel, uh, Dr. Chu um, worked with about nine or 10 other members of the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine who were physicians who were really at all of these events. They continue to be boots on the ground at the campus level. And so they really were feeding questions, concerns, insights and, and, and to Stephanie and she was then giving them back to uh, the panel so that really was, was, was a, a very interesting and, and useful interaction. The other group, um, John, that you asked me to address is the CAF group, the, the COVID action team. So that's essentially the senior management team of the NCAA plus our general counsel. And the senior management team is, is basically the, the senior vice presidents um, and executive vice presidents of the, of the NCAA overseeing the various divisions um, from a staff point of view. Um, it does not include Mark Emmert and Donald Remy, the president and, and COO. We report out to them on a very regular basis. And our function is, is twofold. One is we look at the national staff and the concerns of, of the over 500 employees there. But more importantly, we're really addressing uh, the concerns about the, the, the membership. And, and, and so, you know, what is going to happen in the summer? What's going to happen in the fall? And we're also discussing uh, the winter season and winter championships. So, so we're really keenly um, looking into all of the considerations, not just health and safety, but legislative and, and um, from a, an, an eligibility point of view, what really needs to be done. And, and so that group has been meeting, you know, we were meeting twice daily for quite some time. Now we're meeting on a, a daily basis. So, so that's sort of the, the, the core interactions that we're having on a regular basis, John. Thanks, Brian. Jess, I want to go to you next and talk a little bit about uh, activity from the Committee on Competitive Safeguards and Medical Aspects of Sport. We'll, we'll shorten it going forward and refer to it as CSMAS uh, for the sake of time. Uh, but I know that that group is one of a number of membership uh, committees that has been very engaged with the third group that I mentioned in my introductory comments, which is the Playing and Practice uh, Seasons Working Group, which I happen to be involved in. I know that to be a staff group that's really trying to tackle scheduling and in, in other issues that affect summer access, the beginning of the, of the practice season in the fall, and to some degree, the, the structure of the competitive season. And, and that group, which is composed almost entirely of staff, is very integrated and connected into key membership committees, football oversight committee, for example, the competition oversight committee, for example, the D1 and D2 structure, but also CSMAS. And so that as health and safety related issues arise, uh, we are, are referring them out for engagement and consideration by CSMAS and specifically maybe you can talk about the subcommittee. But from your perspective, give me a sense of the way that CSMAS is positioned and how they're working to respond to these emerging issues. Yeah, absolutely, John. Um, I also wanted to say hello to everyone and uh, thank you. Thank you for having uh, me be part of this. Um, so the CS CSMAS, the CSMAS committee, um, has a subcommittee. Um, and it's, it's existed for some time, the Performance and Prevention Subcommittee. It was really created to address these types of specific needs. Um, it, was, it, was the doc, uh, it was involved in the catastrophic injury document um, and really well positioned to consider the specific return to play and medical issues we are facing due to COVID. As the COVID-19 plan and practice season working group identifies their needs of its members, the commit, our committee provides expertise in sports medicine, exercise science, uh, specifically within the collegiate environment. Um, we really wanna um, make sure and ensure that the plan and practice seasons working group 
um, has all the information they need to make informed decisions. Um, so a lot of their information comes to us. Our subcommittee, the Performance and Prevention Subcommittee, will, will make recommendations. Um, and then that goes back uh, to that working group. Great, thanks. Steph, you, you are in an interesting uh, place because you are participating in, in both uh, efforts simultaneously. You are participating in the advisory panel that Brian mentioned earlier, but you're also a member of this prevention and performance subcommittee. And so we're seeing these CSMAS based issues. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, what you see as the leveling difference between the issues that are, that are coming to both groups and, and talk a little bit about your experience. Some of the issues um, in both groups, I believe, are um, are trying to get the athletes back. Um, and um, I think on the advisory panel, we're trying to get the athletes back and we're trying to figure out how to um, not spread disease further and how to be able to test athletes in a regular basis or monitor athletes on a regular basis to make sure that illness doesn't occur. Simultaneously, on the CSMAS subcommittee, we're trying to get the athletes back, but they've missed a big section of their training. And so we're trying to assess um, what needs to be done from a COVID standpoint um, and um, evaluations that might need to be done. Um, if they had the illness, um, could there be athletes that were asymptomatic carriers? Um, which we are hearing more about, and, and especially in our um, population that we are working with. Um, and then um, those, the testing that we need to do in order to make sure that they are ready to compete in their sport. So there are things that are happening on both levels. We're also trying to manage when is it safe for the athletes to get back on campus. Um, and from the advisory panel, we're kind of looking at numbers across the country, um, testing capabilities across the country. Um, and, um, and then once it is safe to come back, how does that look for an athletic department? And how does that look for the team physicians and um, all the work that needs to be done in order to clear the athletes to get them to compete? Um, so there are a lot of play between the two groups um, to try to figure out um, once we get them back, um, how we're going to make sure that they're safe to participate. Um, but then we need to make sure that we are getting them back at a safe point um, in terms of the virus. Thanks, Stephanie. Kim, you're not only a member of CSMAS, but you also happen to be participating on this uh, subcommittee that's, that's responding in, in almost real time to these issues. Talk a little bit about your perspective and, and especially how the issues that uh, have been considered that you know will be considered by the subcommittee resonate with you as a as an athletic trainer. Sure, John. Thanks. I appreciate being here. Also, um, I I think that my experiences uh, being part of this committee have really helped me in many ways in looking at some of the issues because it is such a diverse group. We have expertise from all different aspects of athletic performance. So there's strength and conditioning professionals, other physicians, and and folks that have really a a, a performance. Uh, background that can help us look at the questions that are presented to us in terms of the answers of what, but but also the why. And our, it, it's a difficult time when there isn't a lot of research or evidence to support our decision making. So in many ways, we're all relying on each other and our experiences um, and sort of raising concerns that we can then work through with the NCA staff um, present on our calls to help guide our conversations. Um, and, and help us get to a place where we can really inform the, the various membership institutions who are really looking for guidance and help. So it's, it's really fun and I feel like I've been informed a great deal just by the conversations and, and trying to get to a place where, where we're really offering some solutions to the group. Can, can you give me a sense of how frequently the, the group is meeting? Sure, yeah, we, we started out uh, pretty regularly meeting about every two weeks, um, and that was probably back in, in March, um, and that's accelerated quite quickly to weekly meetings, and the past few, I'd say the past month, we've, we've increased to twice a week, so we're all getting to be best friends on, on uh, all kinds of virtual media platforms. <laughs> And, and I think we'll have an opportunity, uh, based on some, some questions I'll be asking later, to talk about some of the specific issues that the subcommittee has dealt with. 
for now, Brian, I want to come back to you. And, and you made reference to a document that was released a couple of weeks ago, uh, the core principles of resocialization and collegiate sport. And I wanted to explore that just a little bit more. First, if you could talk a little bit about what led to the development of that document. What, what was the need? Well, that originated from conversations with the advisory panel and, and uh, you know, there was a point in time when we said, well, can we really bring uh, sport back? And this was before uh, the White House had issued the guidelines of opening up America again. So we put together a draft document and, and, and that was circulated for review. And then the White House came out with their guidance on opening up America again with the phase one, phase two, phase three approach. And, and the documents had a lot of similarities. So uh, we, we actually decided to, to merge them because it just made sense that, you know, the, the advisory panel wasn't being alone here. The, the White House document really was, was grounded in, in, in a lot of good scientific thinking. Um, and so that was put out and it was meant to serve as, as broad guidance uh, to the membership that if we're going to um, be starting sport again, well, uh, you know, don't just bring everyone back all at once and, and you know, you want to bring people back in phases and, and there are two reasons uh, to do that. One is um, that as you gradually open up any aspect of society, whether it's sport or, or business or, you know, playgrounds or what have you, you want to be certain that when you do so, um, that you haven't all of a sudden created a new wave of infections and, and, and importantly, that you haven't compromised the, the healthcare infrastructure. So there always has to be the ability for hospitals to operate for surge capacity and in case there is all of a sudden a new influx of, of COVID-19 cases because they, they really, they're the ones that are hospitalized have such respiratory compromise and if they are on a ventilator, they're often on the ventilator for three or four weeks or, or, or longer and and unfortunately, at least the data from New York City, if they're on a ventilator, 90% of them never come off a ventilator. So, so it's important understanding the infrastructure and, and, and really what's happening from a surveillance point of view. And if that, but, but also importantly, it's not just are we causing a, a resurgence of infection, can we handle working with the, this first smaller group of athletes that are not in groups of more than 10 and, and, and you know, they're, they're physically distancing during exercise. So it's also a good way of testing out are the protocols that we have at our institution, are they working right? And so then we move into increasing uh, levels of engagement, um, finally to phase three. And, and, and I'll just say very importantly, um, when with the national guidelines, with, with this uh, resocialization of, of sport guidance, uh, phase three is not like as we were before COVID-19, phase three is the new normal where, you know, you're, you're still at a very heightened sense of, of infectious disease precaution and, and most of your day-to-day -day living, um, you're, you're really still physically distancing, universal masking and, and, and really, you know, the strict uh, hand hygiene and so forth. What's different in phase three in sport is that for contact collision sports especially, that's when they start engaging and the physical distancing does break down. And so you really want to be certain at that level that first of all, you've built up to it properly, that you can really do the proper surveillance and that you understand if all of your checks and balances are working. And then there's going to be a whole new level of, 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 of sort of surveillance that needs to take place there. So, so it was really meant, John, as a as sort of a just a way of how we can re-engage in sport and, and we felt really good that it was in, in keeping with the national guidelines of how to re-engage as a society. It's been a couple of weeks since the, the document was released and as you know, Brian, the, the membership uh, ha has begun to think very specifically about how those guidelines apply. There, there are two questions I wanted to ask and follow up. The first is testing. Uh, more and more attention being given to testing schemes and protocols and, and how they overlay on resocialization. So uh, I'll start there first. If you could talk a bit more about some of your evolving thinking about how testing is going to uh, be relevant to these resocialization efforts. So even in the national guidelines, John, um, uh, surveillance and testing were considered to be an important part of properly uh, opening up America again. And, and, and we certainly see that in, in sport. Um, the, the difficulty with testing is that where we are today, 
even though it's radically better than where we were, say, in, in the second week of March, it's still not sufficient for where we need to be when, when competitions begin. So just a, maybe a couple of uh, brief things about testing. So, you know, one thing just historically that's important. So on, on March 12th, when, when the final four and, and the other championships were canceled, we imagined, can, can we do like a mini final four? Let's just pick four teams. Because just from a contractual point of view, all we had to do was play one game and crown a national champion. And that would have then brought in the, the money from the contract that then is redistributed to the membership. But there was no way even to do that back then. So we, we thought, uh, well, first, it's not fair to if you choose four teams. It's not fair to the other 64 that aren't chosen. Um, and, and, but, but more importantly, if, even if we had done this in Atlanta on the, on the campus of Emory State where the CDC is and, and, and you know, we had a, a smaller arena and we had two of the experts from the advisory panel were there, at that point in time, the only testing that was available was, was very limited. It was really at public facilities. Um, so it was, there was one at Emory's lab. And, uh, you know, they could only do testing for the critically ill. They didn't even have the capacity for testing the ill. So it was highly prioritized testing. The fastest turnaround was 72 hours. So there was no way you could justify having a game not knowing who's infected because we couldn't test the players or the officials or anyone. Flash forward to today and, and you know, it's a very different sort of infrastructure and, and the, the kind, of, kind of testing that's evolving, first talk about diagnostic testing. So there's the, the, the PCR where we're looking for viral particles, the amplification of, of the nucleic acid. And, and so that's sort of the gold standard right now. And, but with that, you really, the gold standard still remains the nasal pharyngeal swab which is, is a little dangerous for the person who's actually giving the test because it, it gives a gag reflex and someone coughs. So you have to have perfect uh, personal protective equipment and you really need the reagent. And, and there's not an abundance of reagents in this country. So, so that's the one kind of testing. The advantage of PCR, it has a great sensitivity approaching 100%. What's evolving are, um, you know, decisions about whether we can just use nasal swabs or even saliva is being tested and that would be um, infinitely better if it were accurate than nasal pharyngeal swab and the other thing that that's uh, two things that are evolving for diagnostic tests one is a uh, point of care tests both that look at the viral antigen i'm sorry the viral particles and another one is that looks at antigen testing so there is an antigen test that was recently released and it's about 80% sensitive. It got uh, fast track approval by the FDR. It can give the diagnosis in about 10 minutes. So it's like a common uh, flu test in a doctor's office, but it's only 80% sensitive, but it just came out and, and the hope is that that's going to be a game changer and, 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 and it could be you know, significant in terms of saving money. The other sort of diagnostic test, but it really is sort of a surveillance test is what we call bulk batch testing. This could also be a game changer and, and we hope this is gonna be available over the next several weeks. So um, bulk batch testing, if any of you have ever uh, donated blood, uh, a sample of your blood is pooled with a thousand other blood donors. And then there's one test done for HIV. And if that bulk batch one test of all the thousand pooled samples is negative, we know because of the sensitivity of that test that all 1,000 of those donors are HIV negative. If it comes back positive, then you have to do the mathematics and say, okay, we got to find out who was the one out of 1,000. So let's do four batches of 250 or 10 batches of 100 and so on until you find that person out. Right now, the bulk batch testing is only capable for maybe four or five at a time, which really isn't sufficient. But a new methodology just came out. Um, last week, which allows us to test up to 50 at a time. If that's proven to be successful and we can then increase that to 100, 500, that'll be another game changer. Other types of tests are serology tests. And serology looks at uh, two components, the IgM component, which is the active infection. So it indicates if you are actively infected, but it's not really, it doesn't have the sensitivity and specificity of the PCR test. And then there's the IgG test, um, which tells you if uh, theoretically, if you have had a past infection, the problem with the IgG serology is that it's specificity. So 
In other words, you don't want to have false positive. Its specificity is only between 95, 98%. And because the prevalence of this disease may be as low as 1%, if you don't have 100% specificity, the test really isn't that worthwhile. But the advantage, if we could get the serology testing and it really made sense, would be we could understand who has had the infection. That may guide some parts of the pre-participation physical exam, and, and, and Stephanie could probably elaborate further on, on, on that. Um, and, and, it, you know, and then ideally, it would tell us who has immunity to this, but we don't know um, that yet. And then finally, there's surveillance testing. I think where the testing is really going to become important, uh, John, is um, so every school is going to work a little bit differently, but I think there'll be some sort of, of testing. But once you move into the contact collision sports and they're really engaging in practice, especially if there's going to be a competition or NCAA championships, I think at that point in time, it's going to be really important to understand, okay, is there someone who's actively infected? and they're contagious. And if they are, we want to know that before the game. And so we don't have the testing paradigm set up. And, and I can tell you that uh, the NFL, Major League Baseball, the NHL, the NBA, Major League Soccer, they all are working on these protocols as, as we speak. Um, and they may change. I'm sure they're going to change over the next month. But that's an idea we, you know, that we need to know. And then the other thing with testing is what happens if someone tests positive? And is there a protocol that would be acceptable by, by you know, local health officials, state health officials, even, and this is probably gonna be going up to the national level, either you shut all of the close contacts down for 14 days, which essentially means shutting a football team down, um, or you have a protocol where you're testing everyone for a period of, and what is that, five, six days, and uh, where, where the window of, of, of you know, infectivity is, is, is really high, and we get a sense of someone is going to become infected. So these are all evolving, and so none of this is written in stone, but that gives you an idea of the landscape, how it's shifted considerably, John, and um, where we sort of understand it right now. Um, but there's still a, a lot of room for wait and see and for maneuvering over, over the next four to eight weeks. And let me ask one, one follow-up question, Brian, and I'll invite Stephanie to comment as well. A very practical question about how institutions across all three divisions should be thinking about how they'll go about securing testing capacity. Uh, what, what sense do you have of what that process is going to look like across the association? Well, it, it's not a unified process because it varies state to state. Um, it varies if your school is on a hospital setting or as a research laboratory, like Purdue announced they're gonna utilize their, their research laboratory. I think what is really important is for member schools to be having these discussions as a conference. And there's some leverage that, that conferences can can use, and 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 I'll say, uh, you know, Stephanie is part of the Pac-12, and 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 I've been working with 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 the Pac-12 and other conferences, but the Pac-12 has uh, their medical advisory group really is is tight knit, and they've been doing work together for for some time, and and I know they've looked at this at a, at, at a conference level, and and many others have, but that to me makes the most sense. You kind of try to get your bargaining power and. And then it's either going to be, you know, working with a, 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 a you know, a, a public lab or a lab um, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, LabCorp or, or, you know, Quest or something like that. Or that, you know, we'll be at a point where point of care testing makes sense. But, but I think the conference level discussions really should be happening. Stephanie, anything to add to that? And I agree. I agree with that, um, with Brian saying that at, at a conference level, you do have more leverage. You do have more um, clout, I guess, if you go to a lab group and say, hey, we're going to use you for our testing for X. I think um, the different campuses um, in some of the bigger um, universities are, are looking. And, and I think um, things that you have to be weary of is that, you know, as a, as a team physician and, and as an athletic department, there are all sorts of testing companies that will and testing groups that will come out and reach out to you because they understand that you're trying to get a group of people back on a field and um, and they will offer, offer you these tests and to have the good medical personnel to kind of review those tests and make sure and talk to administrators and make sure that they understand that 
that the sensitivity and the specificity isn't there for those tests or um, explaining the serology test to them and explaining um, why it's, it's just not cost effective and worthwhile right now to kind of do that blanket testing because we don't have the, the one that we need, I guess. Um, the other thing I know some campuses are doing is they are um, also kind of working with the, their universities. And so the universities do have opening up plans as well. And those students are gonna be coming back on campus and not having the contact um, exactly that an uh, contact collision sport is gonna have but they are going to be coming into contact with each other all the time. And so I know a lot of universities are talking in trying to figure out a testing plan as well. So I think that, you know, kind of all coming together and figuring out the best um, opportunities that are out there and the best um, cost effective opportunities that are out there to make sure that we can um, do good testing and, and kind of catch disease and make sure we limit spread, but not take away from the community. And John, just one important follow up on, on something Stephanie mentioned and, you know, in, in the plans that we put out and, and, and the guidance that document that's going to be coming out next week. The one thing that is really critical is it is that athletics, their plan should be fully integrated with the university plan and which should be fully integrated with a, a you know, a state and local health plan. and. And one of the things I, I've been discovering, uh, you know, as I'm talking to many, many conferences and schools, is that sometimes the athletics is really uh, compartmentalized away from the university, and it, and it shouldn't be. It's part of the university. And so the discussions are also not what are we doing in athletics, but what are we doing in the university, and, and then athletics is part of the university. Thank you, Brian. Jess, I, I want to turn to you and, and talk a little bit about uh, some of the issues that the CSMAS and the subcommittee has, has been dealing with. Um, really a, a two-part question. Uh, if resocialization is going to eventually guide the student athletes return to campus, I know that the subcommittee has talked about well, what happens in the meantime and, and what what should schools and, and strength and conditioning coaches and student athletes be thinking about in terms of needs for engagement in the meantime? And I, and I know that that's an issue that the subcommittee has, has talked quite a bit about. Uh, I'm gonna start there. I'm wondering if you can, can share a little bit about the, about the subcommittee positions on, on some of those issues. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have really been focused on whether student athlete uh, well-being can be adequate, adequately addressed via the existing legislation and policy, or if there are really specific COVID factors that we have to consider moving forward. Um, one of the big areas that's already been mentioned a little bit is this idea of transition and acclimatization um, of student athletes. Um, what we're seeing across the country is that student athletes have really had different opportunities to exercise and train. Um, and so as we consider um, the return of these student athletes to, to campuses, what are the really best recommendations for schools um, to follow given the restrictions that really COVID-19 um, has created? Great, thanks Jess. Um, I know one of the, just in follow up, I, I know one of the specific questions the subcommittee contemplated was, was whether there was room for virtual, virtual engagement of any kind. Um, you know, would, would there be a recognized health benefit, for example, uh, if a student athlete wanted to voluntarily uh, engage with, let's say, a strength and conditioning coach for the purposes of form check, injury prevention, am I doing this right? Does this make sense? The position did the subcommittee take on, on that issue? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think first and foremost, we really came out and said that we want a strong relationship with sports medicine and our strength and conditioning professionals, that that's really critical at this time. Um, you know, student athletes have had flexibility to speak with sports medicine staff in the past during their time away. Certainly communication with strength and conditioning has been more limited um, as, as time went on. Um, so we really were hoping allow for more flexibility for them to observe. Um, you know, many student athletes have um, limited resources at home, but it's so enjoy being with their team. You know, and really enjoy exercising as a group. Um, but to ensure their health and safety, 
that we really have to make sure that all the existing health requirements um, that are set up for campuses can be met if any virtual workouts can occur. So it's a bit of a challenging environment to, to ensure that all of those requirements can still be met, um, maybe at somebody's home, um, but certainly if they can be met, if virtual workouts can occur, and we are allowing now strength and conditioning professionals to have some observational roles, which I think that they had not had in the past. Thanks, thanks, Jess. And I want to I want to extend the the topic out to to Kim and, and Stephanie and ask you both to comment from from your perspectives as a team physician, as an athletic trainer. This this difficult time in which there's a lot of uncertainty about the degree to which athletes uh, across the association are able to engage in physical activity and maintain some sense of, of readiness, so to speak, uh, has, has generated a lot of conversation. From a, from a medical perspective, what do you two think about and what concerns you uh, when you think about that, that degree of unpredictability that's occurring? Kim, I'll start with you. Well, just to kind of follow up on some of Jess's thoughts, I think as a group, when we were discussing virtual workouts, I had a hard time at first envisioning how that could be done in a safe manner and what adaptations could we make to existing healthcare legislation that would that does support um, students having access to emergency medical care if, if it's needed. Um, and then and then weighing that against the mental health benefits of that student being able to, to work out and feel like they were accomplishing some of their own personal goals, but in a manner that's safe. So it, it took me a while of, of kind of conversing with some of the strength and conditioning professionals that are, that are in our group to understand what voluntary virtual workouts could look like and how those benefits could be realized, but in a manner that did ensure that, that a student could set up a safety um, plan for themselves and, and there could be some requirements that we could do in those areas that would make the safety issue possible. Stephanie, thoughts? Yeah, I think um, the time off and, and bringing athletes back, I think there's, there's a couple of things that as a team physician I, I get concerned about. Um, one is a lot of our athletes left campus and a lot of them might have been rehabbing from injuries when they left campus. Um, and then they went to their homes, and many physical therapy clinics were closed during this time. So they're, they're forced to rehab these injuries at home um, with some, maybe some video conferencing with their athletic trainer and um, equipment that they might have had at home. And so they're going to come back, and um, weeks-wise, they might be, they should be at a certain point, um, with their rehab from their injury or even their surgery, um, but they might not actually be there from a physical standpoint because of the limitations and the um, things that they had to deal with during everything that got shut down across the country. Um, those that weren't injured that went home, again, gyms closed, um, and so not everybody has access to what they need around, in and around their house. A lot of parks closed, so they couldn't even get to open fields and they were forced to do, I know a lot of athletes are, are, are just conditioning a lot because running is, is possible. They could just get out on the street and run um, depending on their neighborhood. So a lot of, you know, I'm, we're hoping cardiovascular fitness and aerobic fitness are well, but the strength portion of it um, might not be exactly up to par. Um, you know, there's very creative things that people have been doing um, to try to do that strength um, training. But I think that coming back, um, just having a good um, chunk of time to assess the athletes medically to make sure that they're ready to come back, but also from a strength and conditioning standpoint, I think that um, while all of our coaches would love that all of our athletes were just at home training to the, to the best of their abilities and they're going to come back more fit than they would have otherwise, um, I don't know if that's going to be the case. And so giving those coaches time to kind of assess fitness so that they know where they're starting from and um, we don't incur a lot of injuries um, right at the beginning and right at the start. Kim, you, you noted that uh, when the committee contemplated this idea of virtual workouts, a, a baseline, of course, was that uh, you know, any existing health and safety obligations, whether those are established through legislation or, or policy, 
uh, have to be satisfied. Uh, those, they're, they're present whether we're talking about an in-person or, or a, a, a virtual situation. And, and I'm, I guess I'm, I want to ask the both of you and bring Brian in as well, um, a, a key document that, that I know the subcommittee has often referenced in these discussions is the interassociation recommendations on the prevention of catastrophic injury and death. Uh, that, that's been a frequently discussed and consulted document because of um, many of the topics that it addresses. I'm, I'm wondering if the, the three of you can say just a bit more about how you see the guidance in that document overlaying some of these deliberations about, you know, virtual activity, but even when we think about student athletes coming back to campus and beginning what, what would be their, their, their preseason practice opportunities. Kim, start with you. The group, uh, the, the subcommittee has referenced that document and used it as a resource multiple times in our discussions. I think that it provides some really excellent detail around what a uh, phased in approach might look like in terms of a strength and conditioning program um, and, and would allow for that individualization because like Stephanie was alluding to, our athletes are gonna come back in varying levels of, of condition and, and physical readiness. It's not gonna be consistent across the board. And so I think that document really helps to provide a framework to meet people where they are and then bring them through a progression safe. So I, I found that it's particularly timely and, and helpful in our discussions. Brian, Stephanie, thoughts? Well, from, from my point of view, it, uh, it just, it's, it's a wonderful document that was endorsed by, by so many groups, um, including our strength and conditioning colleagues. So it, it's especially important in a framework where everyone is a little anxious to get people in shape quite quickly when there's been such a prolonged downtime. And, and it's during that specific period of time that, that people can be at greatest risk. So, uh, so it's, it's fortunate that document's there. I, I think people are looking at a, another document put out by, by the National Strength and Conditioning Association and Collegiate Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association. They developed a more granular document that, that really used the catastrophic injury document as a platform. And so I, I think there's a great deal of respect that's out there the, because not just because these documents exist, but also because they were developed in, in such a consensus-based manner and so many people endorse them. And now here's, here's a real opportunity where the rubber meets the road, rubber meets the road where, where it has to be done properly. Stephanie, anything to add? No, I think that's covered well, it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with you uh, for, the, for the next question. Um, keeping on this line of, of some of the very specific issues that, that I know CSMAS and the subcommittee have contemplated, one of them is uh, existing requirements around mandatory medical examinations, uh, you know, what, what providers typically refer to as pre-participation exams. And I know the committee spent quite a bit of time talking about this. Um, if you could summarize, Stephanie, uh, you, your recollection of, of those conversations, what, what did the subcommittee see as the challenges, if any, uh, and, and what ultimately do they, do they think is appropriate when it comes to the existing mandatory medical examination requirements for both uh, incoming students, first year transfer students, but also for returning students? I think initially, um, one of the first things we talked about was um, how medical care has really changed during the COVID time and telehealth became um, something that was a little bit more prevalent. Um, and so one of the main questions and one of the first questions that was asked was, would a telehealth visit suffice for a pre-participation physical? Um, and I think um, from the team physicians that are on the committee um, and the other physicians and providers, um, yes, a lot of clinics were closed and a lot of offices were offering telehealth appointments. Um, however, what was pretty unanimous across the board was that um, well child checks and um, athletic sports physicals, um, those were, were visits that um, physicians were still allowing to come into their offices um, if they were healthy, well individuals. And that's because they didn't want children to lag on their immunizations during this time. Um, and, they, and they felt that those well checks were, were still possible and necessary. And so um, 
kind of going along with, um, you know, cardiovascular disease and, and athletes, um, we also decided that an incoming or a new athlete, um, it is very hard to assess their cardiovascular um, exam via a telehealth appointment. Um, and that was something that we just didn't think was appropriate um, for an incoming athlete or even a transfer athlete, um, because those that um, athletic sports department um, would want that information um, from a live visit um, and be able to, to do that cardiovascular exam. Um, and so we, we didn't think that the access was going to be lacking. We felt that it still was going to be able um, to be um, done if um, the schools themselves aren't um, performing those physicals like on campus, if, if um, some of the lower divisions are bringing those physicals in from um, an outside provider. Um, we felt that the existing legislation should stand and a telehealth visit um, shouldn't uh, trump what, what is existing out there. Um, and then you kind of look at the returner physical. So under normal circumstances, the returner physical um, has up until I think August of that academic year and um, they just need to kind of update their medical records per se. Um, and it, it's literally paperwork. For the most part, it's paperwork, um, and you and you update and you look and see if there's screenings or things that happened in the last year that you might want to bring them in for for a full face-to-face um, -face exam. But otherwise, they get you know checkmarked and they can kind of go on their way. Given this long period of time that these athletes um, were away from their sport, were away from training, um, possibly in contact with COVID or even had COVID. Um, a lot of these athletes are going to need to have actual physicals again. Um, and so I think the committee talked about what that looked like for athletic departments to kind of do returner physicals in a way that they never have um, when, camp, when students return. Um, and to actually give that time to medical staff to be able to perform the necessary medical evaluations that are that are needed after COVID um, to make sure that these athletes are um, healthy and safe to start participation. So it looks very different than what we are used to um, in terms of even returner physicals. Um, and then you throw in another layer and that is um, uh, why do we need so many days so or or a, a prescribed number of days <clears throat> um, normally we have these things called mass physicals so you bring in a bunch of athletes and you can kind of roll them through um, and um, and get uh, hundreds of them done in a, a day or half a day even depending on how many physicians you have working um, given the social distancing and the things that need to happen and the um, cleaning in between patients that need to happen, those are kind of not going to happen as, as an option. Um, and so giving that um, amount of time um, and kind of making it recognized that, um, that this, is, this is important, the medical evaluation is important, and yes, it is a difference because of COVID, um, the medical staff needs that, that time to be able to properly assess their athletes. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. It, it, it strikes me as, um, you know, a really interesting role for the subcommittee on this question, you know, ultimately deciding that the existing requirements should stay as is, but acknowledging, uh, you know, these unusual questions and uh, increased inquiry around telehealth and in really serving an advisory capacity to the membership. You know, the legislation itself is quiet on telehealth, but here are some things that the membership should be thinking about and, and really re-emphasizing the importance of, of local medical decision making for how those practices play out. I want to shift gears a bit and, and Jess, I'm, I'm going to come to you because uh, as you well know, uh, as, a, as a clinical sports psychologist, uh, this situation uh, has has uh, raised great concern uh, about mental health issues, not only among student athletes, but and we really you're seeing a sustained social conversation about what what quarantine and work from home has has done socially. But, but let's start with a discussion about about student athletes. From your perspective, what what are you seeing personally in your practice? What are you hearing from colleagues? 
uh, about the kinds of challenges that the current situation uh, brings to, to our student athletes from a mental health perspective. Um, absolutely. So I, quickly after spring sport came to a halt, the Student Athlete Advisory Council put out a statement, and that statement was directed at mental health, and I think they kind of put it the best, um, which I think is still continuing which was, you know, thousands of student athletes, you know, feeling heartbroken, sad, angry, confused, and many more emotions. And I think for many student athletes that has continued. Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't changed. Um, the, those who are experts in disaster psychology have really described this as a disaster of uncertainty. And the two pieces of that that make it such a toxic um, experience is the ambiguity that people are experiencing and the uncertainty. Um, and th those two pieces have really the biggest impact on psychological trauma and what we'll also term as just burnout. Um, and, and that's what we're facing with this pandemic. And that th the interesting thing about this is that these student athletes are gonna be coming back to campuses and being re-engaged in their sport while the pandemic is still continuing. So often the disasters occurred and now we're kind of recovering, we're coming back. But this, this curve, like the, the normal curve that we typically see within disasters, um, it's gonna be a little bit different. And that is due to the fact that it, this, it's continuing and people are gonna continue to have trauma um, in their families, uh, in their communities. Um, and you know, we'll, still be, we'll, we'll still be facing this. The general um, information we have on response to trauma is a 30-30-30 is a model. So 30% of those who experience a trauma will move through it with very little impact um, mentally, emotionally. 30% will have a pretty significant um, impact, um, will have symptoms, um, and about 30% will be debilitated as a result of that trauma. Um, and what that, what that really does, I think, for us as clinicians um, working with student athletes is it supports a, a focus on a mental health continuum that's not just focused on pathology, but really focused on resilience. And that we're hitting this continuum at every aspect because we're trying to essentially access all of those student athletes that we know that there are things we can do to kind of move them along that continuum. Um, so I don't think of this as just those who are going to have significant symptoms, right? But this is really moving everybody towards a resilient, a resilient model. Um, it puts a, a little more of an onus, I think, on, on our um, institutions to provide this care, maybe in a little bit of a different way, you know, actively promoting wellness. I know, you know, our athletic, athletic departments, um, many of them do a wonderful job in this area. I think this is going to be just more encouraging of really actively, actively promoting wellness. Um, and, and wellness right now is you know, staying engaged and um, staying connected. I think those are like the two biggest areas that we're really finding from a psychological perspective have meaning um, for society and certainly for our student athletes. Um, I, I'm curious how we're going to now use peer support. Um, typically in a disaster psychology model, we're really considering peer support. So program um, you know, that really address things like psychological first aid. Um, it's really a, you know, a, not a provider-based um, uh, model, but it's, you know, to, to teach peers how to support, um, how to provide a kind of caring perspective um, to, to their friends and peers is uh, really helpful. I think also um, teaching our, our leaders to be resilient, right? So that's even to our coaches. How do we coach through this? You know, how do we consider this in our student athletes? Um, and then, of course, a full array of psychological services that we would typically see, you know, with any um, with any student athlete population. So let, let me ask one follow up then and I'll open this to the entire group um, as as our campuses think then about their resources and the utilization of those resources, given that there's a great variety uh, in, in resources across the entirety of the association, what should they be thinking about? They have, if they have concerns, if 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 they're looking for uh, things that they can use, what are what are some uh, recommendations that this group would make uh, as they begin to lay their plans down for attending to the mental health needs of returning student athletes? 
I, I can start out this. Um, um, first is just to consider it, right? To really think about how are we gonna, how are we going to assess as they come back onto campus? And again, not just assess, um, I, I think this is also important to think, not just assess the current symptoms that they're experiencing, but also are they psychologically ready to come back to play? Right. Um, and are they are they really ready for the, either whether it's a contact sport, um, whether they're really ready for that, because you can imagine it could create um, a, a lot of fear. I do think and I mean, this area, the resources in this area, I think, are coming out quickly. Um, certainly, the NCAA, you know, they have a COVID-19 um, page with a mental, a mental health resource page. Um, it links to the CDC and to the National Alliance of Mental Illness that both have wonderful resources right now. Um, the COVID-19 page on the NCAA site also has just a list of daily strategies um, for our student athletes, coaches, administrators to, to think about and, and how they really improve well-being. Um, the American Psychological Association, they've developed a resource page um, specifically addressing um, COVID-19 resources. Um, you know, so those, there, there are a lot of resources available. I think we have to both consider our assessment. So how do we know um, what our student athletes are experiencing? Um, and that will, that will fall a lot in that, that evaluation that as they come back in onto our campuses, it'll happen by a lot of our athletic trainers with that front line of assessment and um, decide whether referral um, needs to happen. Um, and they may provide actually recommendations at, point of, at that point about how to continue on just in, in their own wellness. Um, you know, I'll, I will also suggest this is really a time for providers to think about their own mental health and well-being. Um, a lot is being written about that. So, you know, not only we're going to have student athletes exposed potentially to some risk, athletic trainers, the sports medicine physicians, the coaches, I mean, everybody is going to be exposed to potentially a higher risk. We want them to really consider how do they take care of their well-being? Um, how do they take care of their mental health, um, you know, in, in, in this situation? I'll move up to some of the other people to, to, to provide feedback to. Yeah. Any other comments from the group? I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, we, we noticed early on in, in trying to connect with student athletes that they were really struggling with the lack of structure. They went from a really structured existence to almost no structure instantly. And they, even weeks after arriving at home, were still really having a hard time developing a routine. And, and so really getting in, into helping them do that, or at least talking through some strategies with them was something we were doing on team calls, individual calls. Um, and, and it wasn't something that I had really thought about before, how used they were to, to this kind of structure. And then now thinking about how different the world is gonna be when they do come back and what we're gonna ask of them in terms of changing the structure of how they've always existed in our facilities, I think we're, hopeful that maybe some education ahead of time before they actually arrive to help them understand what's changed and, and what's going to be different and, and what we're, we're trying to accomplish and the why I think will maybe help them adjust a little bit easier to coming back. I think that's I think a, great, a, a great point, I mean, absolutely wonderful point, Kim. I think as a physician, um, you know, the, the group that we have here is um, a very, very multidisciplinary group. Um, and I think um, on, on whatever campus um, team physicians work on, um, to have that ability to speak with your athletes when, you, when they come back um, and ask those questions and ask them how they're doing. Um, I think that uh, uh, we, we kind of focus on injuries and prevention and cardiac exams and we often just don't ask those questions. And, and we're the ones, the physicians and the athletic trainers are the ones that are gonna see them right away. Um, they're not necessarily going to sign up to see the clinical psychologist when they, when they get on campus. And so, um, and then having a plan. So not all campuses have a robust um, psychological um, services group or, or people that they um, align with, but, but, but finding those things out, um, I think are, are important. And I know in, in and just uh, my regular patient population, bringing it up and, and just saying, hey, you know, it's, it's okay to, be, to feel like you do, but let's talk about it and let's find out where we can get some help. Yeah, and just, I agree with, with, with everyone and, and, and especially uh, uh, Stephanie's point that, that we just, 
everyone asked the question and and i think there's going to be a couple of new norms you know but one of them asking the question about mental health because so many people are suffering we just received survey data that we obtained from student athletes and and it's clear that uh, they are suffering more mental health uh, uh, symptoms and, and disorders. The one thing that I'm, I'm really hopeful will be, will be available when uh, everyone is returning to campus, um, and, and we have uh, had presented this actually at, at the PAC-12 Mental Health Conference, and that's two tools that uh, are hopefully will be published this June or July in the British Journal of Sports Medicine um, that they have been validated now. They came from the International Olympic Committee. One is the Sports Mental Health Assessment Tool. So it's the first um, a screening tool that has a detailed algorithm that is specifically for high-level athletes, and that's being that's to be used by by licensed uh, healthcare providers. But then there's also the sports mental health recognition tool that can be used by coaches, strength and conditioning personnel, and it's more about sort of a one-page green light, uh, yellow light, red light um, that that they're able to uh, ask those specific questions. And if you're in the red light category, you don't leave that athlete until you really have the proper handoff. So, so we're really hopeful that that will be available because it's gonna be a time when it especially will be needed. Thank you, all of you. Uh, I wanna switch gears again, and, and this really is a two-part question. I'm gonna focus on, on Brian and Kim. And this is, these are questions about independent medical care. I, I think as you both know, we, we've heard from the, the provider community, our athletic training colleagues especially, who have begun to ask and, and consider how the independent medical care legislation and the underlying principles are going to apply in situations where uh, campuses begin to return their student athletes. Um, so, so, Brian, I guess the first question to you, as you think about that question and, and the, the role of independent medical care, uh, how do you see it applying? What, what, what are the, the salient points as, as people return to campus? And then, Kim, in follow-up, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about your role as athletics, health, the athletic health care administrator. What should AHCAs be thinking about uh, currently during this period of time, but also what should they be thinking about and doing uh, as they consider the return of student athletes. So Brian, first to you, uh, thoughts about independent med medical care legislation and how it applies to the situation. John, I always remember when that legislation passed and, um, and, and I remember thinking to myself, this is the most important uh, legislation in the history of the NCAA. It really empowered the primary athletics healthcare providers, meaning the team physicians and athletic trainers, uh, to, to, to have unchallengeable autonomous authority for all medical decision making. And this is when it's really going to be important. Everyone's coming back. It's, with, it's a very unknown, uh, uncharted territory. There's going to be perhaps a sense of urgency to get the athletes back uh, sooner than, than they're ready. And so this is the time, I think, as much as any when independent medical care really, really becomes important. And, and that the athletic trainers and the team physicians that that they hold their ground, they know they will be supported to hold their ground. And, and, and so it's, it's just, you know, I, I think between that and the catastrophic entry document, it's, it's a really nice foundation for the athletes returning and, and these really difficult times. Kim, invite your comments about that, but also to talk a little bit about the, the role of the athletics healthcare administrator, which was, which was a product of the independent medical care legislation. I actually appreciate Brian's comments very much because I had the very same impression when I when I saw that legislation and, and, and realized that it had actually passed it was a really it was a really important point I think for for those of us that have been working in athletic healthcare for a long time it addressed some of the challenges that we've had around decision making I, I see the the healthcare administrator role as being really key to building that institutional community that we kind of referenced earlier. It's, it's really that, or I consider it my role to make sure that I reach out to all of the people who have a common interest in safety of student athletes and, and athletes are students. And so that often involves student health resources. Um, in, in our case right now, environmental health and safety and our campus emergency management team are working really closely with us to make sure that our, our plans for onboarding our student athletes 
parallel and, and integrate with the, with the overall plan for campus like Brian was talking about earlier. I think the healthcare administrator role is really to get that group of stakeholders, reach out to those people and get everyone talking and, and planning together versus trying to sort of run around and have individual conversations with different groups. I think the more you can build that community around what the issues are and, and, and then really enhance your local resources, because I think a lot, a lot of times athletic trainers feel overwhelmed um, by what they don't have. And, and I think sometimes if we stop and really reach out, we can find out that we really have a lot more resources than what we thought we had utilizing our, our physician groups and all of the people who are in place currently to support us. I just see this role as really being the facilitator of those conversations. Thank you, Kim. And with that, we are out of time in this session. I wanna thank uh, all of our panelists for the great discussion. Uh, I want to remind those of you that are watching that we've made reference uh, throughout this discussion to a couple of pending documents. I can assure you that uh, additional guidance from the National Office will be forthcoming, uh, updates to existing frequently asked question documents, as well as new documents that, that Brian referenced earlier. Uh, also important to note that you can always submit questions either in follow-up to this webinar uh, or new questions to the Sports Science Institute. There is an email address available for you to do that. That's ssi at ncaa.org. Again, SSI at NCAA.org. Uh, we remind you that there's also a Sports Science Institute website, which is NCAA.org forward slash SSI. And if you go to NCAA.org, you will find right on the homepage uh, a very large link to our COVID-19 page, which includes many of the references and documents uh, that we've referred to in this discussion. So I wanna thank again, Brian and Stephanie, Jess and Kim for their time. Uh, we hope that this has been able to speak to many of the questions and concerns that you have. And we wish you the best of luck as you continue your planning for the summer and the fall season. Thanks everyone.